G'day and welcome to Emergency Medicine Topics in One Coffee. I'm Alan Giles, an emergency physician, and today we're going to take on arterial blood gases. I can see the excitement in your eyes. But let's face it, basic, reliable interpretation of arterial blood gases is absolutely essential if you're going to work in critical care. Okay, so let's start. So what, what do you measure in an arterial blood gas? Well, it's pretty easy. You look at the pH, normal 7.35 to 7.45 or so. Uh, the PaO2, that's the partial pressure of oxygen. So it's the dissolved oxygen in the blood. And the normal for that, well, that does vary with age. Um, one of the equations that you use is you divide your age by four and then you take that away from 100. So if you're 80 years old, 80 divided by 4 is 20, you take that away from 100, that's 80. 80 should be what a very healthy 80 year old would be um, on an FiO2 of 0.21 or 21%, so um, room air. Uh, so what else do we measure? Well, PaCO2, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, and we measured bicarbonate. Now, the bicarbonate, we actually calculate using the pH and the CO2. So it's a calculated, not directly measured number. And we also do base excess, normal base excess between minus three or so and plus three. And base excess is the amount of base you have, or acid you have to add uh, to it to bring it back to a pH of normal at a CO2 or PaCO2 of 40 millimeters of mercury and temperature of 37 degrees Celsius. Okay, enough of the normal stuff. You know most of that. Let's look at how you interpret it. So first of all, you get a blood gas, you look at the pH. If the pH is acidotic, what do you do? You go straight, the next step is to look at the CO2. So if the CO2 is elevated, the primary problem is respiratory. It's primarily a respiratory acidosis. Okay. So what's the cause of respiratory acidosis? Well, anything that increases your CO2, um, anything from a central depression and narcotic ingestion down to pulmonary edema and fluid in the lungs. So there's a whole wide differential diagnosis. Now, your body doesn't like having an abnormal pH and it tries to compensate. And this is the important thing which you need to also understand as we go through is the compensation. And this equation here, which is pretty simple, is going to be our friend. What it does is it shows us how the respiratory area and the renal area of your body are linked. And how if you have abnormalities in one area, you can compensate by another area. In this case, what happens is the high CO2, and we said high CO2 with the respiratory acidosis, it's pushed this equation to the right it's formed all that H plus. And that H plus, your kidneys go, okay, we're gonna kind of compensate. Let's try and weed out. Yeah, but they're not real good at doing that. So what happens is instead they think, okay, well, we might try and hold back bicarbonate to oppose that acidosis. And that's what they do, holds back bicarbonate. But it takes a while to occur. It takes a number of days for that to occur. So that's why it's called uh, a chronic compensation. Now, is it any good? Well, for every chronic increase of CO2 of 10 millimeters of mercury, you get about four milli equivalents per liter of bicarb held back. Okay. Well, why don't we now go on and, and look at um, a couple of, just a couple of examples about respiratory acidosis. Let's do that. Okay. So here's a patient who's got severe CAL, long-standing shortness of breath. The pH, 7.35, just in the edge of normal. And the CO2 is elevated at 60. The bicarbonate's elevated at 34. So what's happened is this is a fully compensated respiratory acidosis. The body has responded by pulling back bicarbonate from the kidneys. Whereas in this case, this is a 34 year old comes in with an acute flail segment, pH 7.1, CO2 60. And you'll see that the bicarbonate hasn't moved. There hasn't been time to do that compensation. 
So it's acute in its uncompensated respiratory acidosis. Okay, so now you look again at another patient and you see that, like the previous one, the patient has got a pH which is acidotic. So you look again at the CO2. Well, now the CO2 is in fact low. Well, what happens here is that it's a metabolic acidosis. You've got too much H plus around and your body's responded to this by blowing off CO2. So it can, the H plus can bind with the bicarbonate and your CO2 can blow it off and it can push the equation to the left. Understandably, the bicarbonate will be decreased because it's used up with the H plus. There's a whole lot of causes for this. Um, I mean, more commonly we see things like DKA, renal failure, some ingestions, but many people will use mnemonics to remember it, such as mud piles, which I'll put up now. But let's go again to another example, just, just to reiterate what happens with metabolic acidosis. Here you can see we've got a 15 year old girl that's come in and they have quite a severe acidosis. Their pH is right down and you look at the CO2 and it also is down. So this is a metabolic acidosis. And you can see that also the bicarbonate has appropriately dropped as it's been chewed up to bind up with the H plus that's around. This, this patient, DKA, um, needs some insulin, needs some fluids and needs to be seen pretty quickly. Excellent. So, we've looked at acidosis and we've looked at, we know that you have to look at the CO2. If the CO2 is elevated, the primary problem is a respiratory acidosis. If the CO2 is low, the primary problem is going to be metabolic acidosis. And we've looked a little bit at what the compensation for those two entities are. Well, let's have a look at alkalosis. Alkalosis, again, you look at the pH, you're alkalotic. Next step, same as before, look at the CO2. In this case, the CO2 is down, so it's going to be a respiratory alkalosis. That is, the primary problem is respiratory. You can think of ways that you'd have your CO2 down from respiratory, you'd increase your ventilation. So, anxiety, pain, hypothyroidism, those sort of things. You'd be breathing faster and blowing off your CO2, and that gives you that primary alkalosis. What do you do to compensate for it? Well, you're trying to make more CO2 to make up for it. So your H plus and your bicarbonate will bind together. And it's back to that equation and the bicarbonate will start to drop. Okay. So what we might do now is again, just look at um, an example. There's a 25 year old lady presents distress following the death of a friend. You can see here she's alkalotic and it's respiratory. Her CO2 is down and the bicarbonate is down. It's being used up. Now, the compensation is partial or incomplete because the pH still hasn't been brought back to normal. So this is respiratory alkalosis with some compensation, but it's incomplete. Good stuff. Only one to go. So. In this case, you look at the pH and it's alkalotic. And again, you do what you always do, you look at the CO2. But this time, the CO2 is not down like it is with respiratory alkalosis, it's normal or elevated. This is the relatively unusual metabolic alkalosis. So, what's the, what could make you get metabolic alkalosis? Well, you, you get that when you lose H+, or you gain bicarb, but more commonly you lose H+. Plus something like pyloric stenosis. Under those circumstances, you lose H+, you become alkalotic, and your respiratory system tries to compensate by hypoventilating. Okay, so the CO2 therefore will rise, as we can see back on our favorite equation. What we might do now is look at another um, example, this time looking at metabolic alkalosis. So here's an example. Here's a 10 day old boy that's been brought in, he's a bit lethargic, he's very hungry and he's been vomiting after every feed. And you can see that his pH shows he's alkalotic, his CO2 is elevated and his bicarbonate 
is also elevated. So you can see in this particular case, he actually has pyloric stenosis. His bicarb is elevated because the body treats bicarb and chloride similarly because they're both uh, negatively charged. So your, your kidneys hold back bicarbonate if you lose a lot of chloride. Now, I've put on the screen the details and amount and type of compensation we do. In reality, in my clinical practice, I remember the chronic respiratory and metabolic acidosis compensations. And I use Google and Life in the Fast Lane to check the others. But I'll leave them up there for a second so you can have a look at it. Okay, let's bring this baby home with a few examples. Remember, there's really only four basic ones. There's metabolic acidosis, respiratory acidosis, metabolic alkalosis, respiratory alkalosis, and the compensation that your body does for that. So let's start working through just three or four examples to finish off. So example one, what have we got here? Okay, pH, they're acidotic. Let's check that CO2. It's down, so it's metabolic. Metabolic acidosis. And the bicarb should be down. Uh, yep. So metabolic acidosis, but it's incomplete respiratory compensation. Okay, I can do that. So let's go again. pH 7.30, it's a bit acidotic. CO2, it's up. So the primary thing is respiratory acidosis. Now remember, have they had time to compensate? Yeah, it takes a few days. The bicarb is appropriately elevated. So this is respiratory acidosis with almost complete renal compensation. Excellent. Okay, another one. pH 7.48. Okay, it's alkalotic. Well, the CO2 is up as compensation, so it's metabolic alkalosis, uh, like a, a pyloric stenosis. Now let's see if they're holding back that bicarb to make up for the chloride. Du, 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 du. Yep. So metabolic alkalosis with respiratory compensation, and it's incomplete because the pH is still abnormal. Okay. Last one, pH 7.55, so that's alkalotic. The CO2, du, 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 du. yep, it's low, so it's respiratory alkalosis. Bicarbonate, eh, it's pretty normal. This is acute respiratory alkalosis, no time for compensation. It actually was hyperventilation after a pink concert. Well, that wasn't too painful, was it? I reckon that'll do for basic arterial blood gas interpretation in one coffee. I'll see you all next time. Cheers.